This is taking it to the nub with shirtless Mike and Boston Jimmy. Boom, Uncle Fester, you have <laughs> arrived. <laughs> yeah, I figured that, that. I figured that would be the highlight of of the show to make people laugh and all that good stuff. Glad we got that figured out in the beginning. So, how was your week, brother? My week was same as last week and same as the week before. Nothing yeah, has changed. That's pretty much how it was for me, too, except for a little a little something. You know, Abe from Smokey and challenged me to shave my head. Yeah. And so I did that, and, you know, it's, it's a nice change. I've actually I got a, the stuff to upkeep the style, so I think I'm going to keep it for a little bit. Good, good. So tonight... We are on taking it to the nub 11. Number this is 11. Episode 11. Um, I am smoking a what's called a gatekeeper, and you are smoking a blind faith. And these cigars come from Alec and Bradley cigars, not. Alec Bradley cigars. Yep, that's one thing I had to, when I was researching, <laughs> I had to learn that. And, you know, Boston Jimmy actually, uh, he actually corrected me on that. So so we're um, going to bring in uh, that one of the co-founders, one of the brothers and sons of Alan Rubin. Uh, but we're going to bring in Alec Rubin now, our special guest. Let's bring Alec in. Alec, welcome. Hey, Boston Jimmy, what's going on? Thank you welcome. for joining. Welcome to Take no, Thanks for having me. Uh, we uh, were just introducing everything, and we were saying what we were smoking, and we're say we told the, the audience that these come from Alec and Bradley cigars, not so Alec they, Bradley cigars. So they probably have no clue what that even means. Yeah. So we'll get into that in a little bit, <laughs> but uh, we'd like to start this off... Uh, uh, shirtless Mike uh, gets things rolling a little. So yeah, th that's anyway. actually what I was going to talk about here. So, you know, I was a little confused at first while I was doing the research. I thought, like, I was unsure about, you know, if, if you if you guys were under your dad's brand, Alec Bradley, but then Boston Jimmy cleared that up. So for those who may not know about that history or whatever, you yep. know, just give us a brief synopsis of uh, of how that all started, you know, you know, with Alec Bradley, you know, he named the company after you and your brother. And then yeah, so my, my dad, my dad, think most people think of my dad is someone named Alec Bradley. I mean, <laughs> I would say it's probably a good 70% of the marketplace thing, thinks that. My, dad, my father's name is Alan Rubin. He named the company after me and my brother. I'm Alec, my brother's Bradley. Um, but he likes to tell people that he bought a, a company named Alec Bradley and then named his kids after it. <laughs> so that's that's what he likes to tell people. Um, and Bradley started working in the company about two years ago now, I think. And I've already been I had already been working there for let's say five years at the time. And I had always known that I wanted to create my own cigars, and I always just thought I would do it under the Alec Bradley name. And I, and I already you know work on help work on the blends. I help pick the blends. I give my two cents on what I think you know the new cigar coming out should be in terms of profile and I go down to the factories, I help blend it and we, you know, we'll come up with, with, let's say, depending on the trip, anywhere from five to 30 cigars that we're going to take back to the States, smoke and figure out what we're going to do for with our next project. And I've been involved in that process for years. So Bradley working at the company for a couple months came to me and said, I think that we should come out with our own cigar. I said, that's a cool idea, but like, how do you want to do it exactly? And he said, I think we need to start our own company. And I was like, okay. Um, I never really even thought about that, but I think we should talk about it, explore it, definitely, definitely, you know, broach this topic with dad and see what he thinks if he, if he likes the idea or not. And he goes, but there's one thing dad is not involved whatsoever in our cigars and i said explain a little bit further and he said if we're coming out with our own cigars this is our opportunity to come out with all of our own packaging the way that we want to do it and all of our own blends that show off our palettes versus uh dad's palette or the vp ralph montero 
uh, really because, you know, the two of them, they don't have similar palettes. They actually agree on nothing, but <laughs> they, I think that's part of the reason why Alec Bradley comes out with so many great cigars is because they, they butt heads so much. And so he said, he's not involved at all. I go, okay, you ready for that conversation with that? Like, I'm cool with it. I'm, I'm in, like, let's do it. Um, but are you ready for that conversation? And he said, yeah, well, what do you mean? Why would that be such a hard conversation? And I said, okay, you'll see. And so we went and we had that conversation with my dad and he was all about the idea. He loved it. He's like, I think that's so cool because our, my dad had always said to us, um, you can either be within this, within this industry, Alan Rubin's sons, or you could be Alec and Bradley, meaning people can just always view you as my sons basically, or you can stand out a little bit on your own and be Alec and Bradley within this industry. And so he was all about the idea until I dropped the hammer on him. And I said, look, here's the one caveat Bradley has not told you yet, or neither have I, is that you're not involved. Like we're doing this whole process on our own. We're choosing the name ourselves. We're choosing the blend ourselves. We're choosing artwork, everything, nuts and bolts. We're doing it all. And he said, oh, okay. Well, let me think about that. Why don't you go back to your offices and I'll call you in when I'm ready to talk to you. And I said, okay, no problem. Um, and Brad was a little bit skeptical and he said, what's going to happen? I just said, wait, you'll see. And so we went back in, I'd say like, I don't know, a couple hours later, whatever, whatever it was. And he goes, okay, I'm all about the idea. I love it. I think you guys should do it. But here's the one caveat. Uh, you guys have to pay for your own production. If I'm not involved, I'm not paying for your production. And I said, cool, like, it's fine, cool, like, let's do it. And Brad's jaw, jaw dropped just a little bit. Like, he was <laughs> not expecting that. Because my dad has this thing, and I think it's just because of him and I have had such a close working relationship for, you know, already five years, let's say, at that point. And Bradley was only in there for two months at that point. So I knew, I knew where he was going to go with it. And my dad always, you know, says this thing that everyone has to have skin in the game. So why would he allow us to have no skin in the game, but completely just run wild with whatever we wanted to do? So by us having to pay for our own production, we had skin in the game. He still allowed us to use re his resources, use his relationships, um, his, sales his sales team, all of that stuff. And we still technically work for Alec Bradley. It's just, we still have the, our, our own line. And yeah, we ran with it, came out with Blind Faith. The reason that Blind Faith only has, uh, was so limited at the beginning is because we had to pay for our production. Otherwise we would have gotten full bore. Yeah. We, came, so, we produced what we could afford. Yeah, right. definitely. And so what was that process like, like actually blending the cigar? You know, you told me earlier, it was like a year long process. So yeah. You know, like, so, 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 so where were the cigars made? And, you know, just tell me about the whole process. Yeah. So it's pretty funny because when your money's on the line, um, picking a cigar that you think is your favorite is a lot easier than when your money's on the line. So like I said, I had been involved in the process for years at that point in terms of picking the cigars that I thought we should bring to market. But when you have to smoke with a purpose and know that your money is on the line, um, it definitely makes you second guess yourself a whole lot more. Yeah. So I think it took us, it was something ridiculous. It was something like 20 blends we went through before we found our base blend. And once we found our base blend, we changed it 10 different times until we got to the final product. Mm. We were arguing at one point over the color. If, you, if you've seen the inside box artwork, the color of the tie that the guy is wearing on the, on the Vista for like two weeks. <laughs> that's how, that's how nervous we were about coming out with our first cigar. What was the importance also of Also did color? something on the, what was that? What was the importance of that color? Nothing. Oh. Would it have made any different in how many cig cigars we sold? Probably not. But, but we are, we get so intricate when it comes to our uh, artwork. Sometimes that even takes longer than figuring out what cigar we want to do. Not always but sometimes it does. And the reason behind the, the color of the tie was just to make what was gonna pop off, what was gonna pop off the shelf better, essentially. 
that's that was the only significance that that the tie had. Um, but that, that for in terms of of the artwork, that was so you know insignificant when you look back at it a little bit. But when we were blending that cigar, which we decided to do it with Rice Rice's Cubanas, who Alec Bradley has been working with for years upon years now. Uh, we we've kind of grown together within the industry, which has been really nice, and we make up a big chunk of their production. And when also when blending the cigar, we had a decision to make: do we do something that is for, you know, every smoker, or do we do something that's for our palates that challenges us? And we decided to go with something that was going to challenge us, and maybe wasn't going to be for everyone, but we could grab the attention of the consumer base that we want to go after. And so we definitely challenged ourselves because that, uh, the filler on that cigar is actually either all Lijeros or Maduros, which is not easy to put in the filler of a cigar because then your binder really has to perform well so that you don't have, you know, issues with the construction. And, but it made for a much better, flavor cigar in our opinion. So that's part of the reason why that cigar took so long as well, that long as well was making sure we had the right flavor with the right construction. It was definitely not a, not an easy and probably was a stupid thing to do for our first blind coming out of the gate, <laughs> but we did it anyways. I mean, I think that's part of the reason, you know, I mean, you know, the, the cigar is called blind faith. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I think, you know, that, that, that says a lot to what you wanted to accomplish with that cigar and everything. Am I, am I allowed to curse on here? You, you whatever do whatever you, you want to do, man. It's your oh. brand. Okay. I just wanted to ask first because the reason, was, well, so the funny thing is Blind Faith didn't start off as Blind Faith. We had a completely different name, completely different artwork. Everything was just had a different field and just, we were at the final stages of, of finishing up the artwork. And Bradley came in one day and goes, I hate it. We'll start from scratch. <laughs> and I said, okay, I'm cool with that. I, I trust your gut. Like, I think that, I think that's the right decision. So blind faith came from people having to have blind faith that we knew what the fuck we were doing. Right. Yeah. That's, that's all it was. People think it's after the, you know, after the band, this, that, whatever. No, people just had to have blind faith that we knew what we were doing. And I think that after smoking it, a lot of people understood what we were trying to accomplish and they trusted us a little bit more. And our second um, release, Gatekeeper, definitely had a great launch, one of, a better launch than I could have expected. And I think if we didn't do what we did with Blind Faith, Gatekeeper would not have been as successful. So what was the response like on, um, you know, on both cigars? You know, you said the, the gatekeeper had a great launch. Like, you know, what kind of reaction do people have? Um, so, that? so it was harder on blind faith to really gauge um, what people thought about it because, like I said, we had to pay for our own production. And since we were doing it at Racist Cubanas, my father could only alloc would like would only allocate us four pairs of rollers because we were untested. He had to focus on his production. And he decided the right, move, the right move was to only allocate us four pairs of rollers. So we had a decision to make. Do we send it to everyone that wants it? Or do we kind of hold back how many accounts that we sell it to and only put it into those accounts? Because if we gave it to everyone and it did well, there was a chance that we weren't going to be able to, get, to send them the cigars again in a timely manner because our production numbers were so low. And we decided to only give it to 150 accounts out of the gate and uh, to make sure that when they reordered, we had the production. So that one was a little bit tougher, only being in 150 accounts. It was really hard to gauge people's reactions. And it also launched at the, t at the same time as Alec Bradley's Magic Toast. So it was weird because people were comparing the two. It was, oh, I like Magic Toast more than Blind Faith. I like Blind Faith more than Magic Toast. And our, th our thought was... You're not meant to compare them. They're two completely different cigars, two completely different profiles. And one is in almost every account nationwide and even it's worldwide. 
and the other one is 150 pounds domestically. So how can you compare the two? They're two completely different projects. So that one was really hard to gauge. But then on the second one, on Gatekeeper, we, um, we did it with Ernesto Perez Carrillo for a few reasons. One, um, to me and Bradley, he's always just been this iconic you know, person within the industry. We have a lot of love and respect for him. I had had a, a previous relationship with Ernesto for a few years. I had known him for a while, and Bradley had never met him, but it was, has always been a huge fan of his cigars. So Bradley came to me and on the second project because we had t been talking about doing something in the Dominican Republic and um, said, hey, if we're going to do something in the Dominican Republic, because Alec Bradley only makes one cigar in the Dominican Republic and we're trying to be a little bit different than what Alec Bradley does, I think we should work with Ernesto. And I said, cool, call him. Let's do it. And he said, I'm not calling him. I said, don't you know him? <laughs> and he said, no. I said, well, I'll give you his number. He goes, honestly, Alec, I'm a little bit intimidated to call Ernesto. I don't know him. He looks like this, you know, kind of rough guy a little bit. I don't, I don't really want to call him. Which is nice. And I said, <laughs> and I said, first off, he's like the biggest teddy bear in the world. And he would love to hear from you, even if you guys have never met each other. But I'm going to be seeing him in like two or three weeks at a multi-vendor event. I will, I'll talk to him about it. And I, I, I told him the idea and within five seconds, he said, yeah, let's do the project. And I know I'm going off course a little bit with your question, but I'm just trying to explain yeah. a little bit what, what happened behind Gatekeeper and why we decided to, to do the project there. Um, but a big reason we also decided to do it there, not just loving Ernesto and his cigars and knowing what he could bring to the table. Also, he wasn't going to limit us on how many rollers that we were able to use. Right. Yeah. So when we came out with Gatekeeper, it was a full fledged launch. And that's why I think it was received so well in the marketplaces because everyone was able to get their hands on it. And I think that's part of the reason of the success, which Blind Faith, it's not that Blind Faith wasn't successful. It's just not as many people had, had touched it or smoked what's, it. So. What's the meaning of the Gatekeeper? So. The name, we were, we were going back and forth on the name for a while, and Bradley wanted something that was really going to pay an homage to Ernesto. And there's many gatekeepers within this industry, but, and we view Ernesto as a gatekeeper, because working with him was gonna open up a lot of doors for us. Um, it was gonna create a lot of talk about, does it taste more like an Ernesto cigar, more like an Alec Bradley, of which, like we said, we were going for nothing like what Alec Bradley does. And we also, and or we explained to Ernesto, we don't want something that's your factory profile. We want to do something completely off the walls for all of us. And he loved the concept, got it right away, knew what we wanted to do. And I think we achieved that because I don't think it tastes like anything that either of us make or have made in the past. But Ernesto truly is the gatekeeper in this, in this scenario. And if you look at the band, it's actually a gold hand holding Medusa's head with gold blood coming down from the neck. Oh, is that what that is? Yeah. Very cool. Medusa, Medusa is a gatekeeper, right? Yes. So it's all tied in and every we like everything we do, we like it to pay like to have it, it all needs to mesh together and the story needs to match the blend and like we everything we do is with a purpose. Everything we do is with a purpose. So there's a lot more thought that goes into uh, our releases than people may, may think or even notice. Now, how do you uh, split up the work between you and your brother? What responsibility? Great question. My favorite question. Um, <laughs> so Bradley and I, um, when we both came into the company, we both made the same mistake. We literally challenged everyone. I don't know if it was a mistake. It was just, it's what we did. We challenged everyone and every decision that could have been made within the company and we came in strong. I did that. I realized, hey, I need to cool it down a little bit because I'm just being annoying at this point. And then Bradley came in and did the same thing. But because I'm his older brother, he tended, he, he leaned toward questioning everything that I said more than everyone else. <laughs> so for the first six months that we worked together, we were at each other's throats. And then when we started our own brand, Alec and Bradley, um, it got worse because now we have to make every decision together. So what we ended up figuring out 
partway in you know, that first year that we were making Blind Faith is that we really needed to split responsibilities toward our passions. And we're both passionate about the tobacco and we're both passionate about the artwork, but Bradley leads a little bit heavier toward the artwork. I, leave, I lean a little bit heavier toward the tobacco. So Bradley takes on the majority of the communication with the graphic designer and the idea and the concept thing toward the project. And then once we figure that out, we kind of say, I kind of say, here's the cigar I think that will match that project. I'm going to go blend that cigar now. And we, there's, there's times that we go together. There's times that we go, that we go separately down to Central America. But when it comes to who's going to like create the blend to match that project and, and that, that concept, I take on that role. But we still have to agree at the end of the day on everything. Otherwise, it does not move forward. So your father was not born into the tobacco world no, like many not. of these brand, these brand mm -hmm. owners that we know. He yeah. actually had a, a company, right, that made like widgets or something, right? It was uh, nut, nuts, bolts, and screws. Nuts, bolts, and screws. He was, in the, screws, yeah. he was right? in the fastener business, yeah. And he did that his whole life. Was that part of your grandfather's business too, or that was just? Yeah. So the story behind that is my great grandfather. Um, they lived up in Canarsie, and they owned a wholesale candy and tobacco business, and they did that up in, the, in New York. Then my grandfather came down here on his honeymoon and never went back to New York. And he owned gas stations or at, for a time he, he was in the cabinet business for the mo most of his life living down here. And then later venture for him, he was in the fastener business. And then when my father was the only one out of the siblings that came into the fastener business with, with my grandfather and the two of them ran it, my father kind of took it over, grew it and sold it because he hated it. And... I think it was his one of like his warehouse manager or whatever it was said, what are you going to do next? And he said, I have absolutely no idea. And he said, well, you smoke cigars from at seven in the morning, the time that you walk in here till the time that you leave, why don't you get in the cigar business? So he, I guess he kind of maybe thought about it a little bit, ended up talking to his local tobacconist and said, Hey, is there a trade show for cigars? And he said, yeah, it's actually coming up in like a month. Why don't you come with me? And he went with him, fell in love with the industry and has not looked back ever since. So he's really the nuts and bolts of the cigar industry. He's the nuts and <laughs> bolts of the cigar industry. <laughs> so that I'll, I'll so say we, we may be in this just about 25 years, but the first 10 years of him doing this were nowhere close to what we're, you know, we're doing now. Right. It so was, that was survival, 10 years of survival time. So in the beginning, did you only know him as the cigar guy? No, I remember a time when he was still, you know, starting the company that he had side jobs because he couldn't do, he, he wasn't making enough money to support the fa our family just through the cigars. I remember he was doing hurricane shutters and this and that and working like, you know, working, doing that. And then in his off time working on the company or vice versa, whatever it was. And so I saw him do different jobs while I was growing up while he was trying to get the cigar company off the ground. So when you, when, when you and your brother were growing up, so you talk mm -hmm. about how you, kind of butted little heads at the beginning when you got into the company. Yeah. Uh, what was it like with the two of you growing up? And he's how much younger than you? He's three years younger than me. So I've always found that to be kind of a weird age difference because with two years or one year, you kind of have, you know, the same friends and you're kind of more, more friends. But once you hit three years, it's this weird mix of you might have similar friends or friends, you know, mutual friends, but also he's my little brother and I have to look out for him. I think I got more and more fights protecting Bradley growing up than I <laughs> did for myself. And um, so it was a very weird kind of age difference, but 
and we're very different people in every single way. Uh, like Bradley and I could not be more opposite, but we were always very close growing up. Yeah. Now, def- again, Mike, you got a question? Oh, I was just going to say, I can definitely relate to that because my brother, I got two brothers that are three years younger than me. Um, mm-hmm. My stepbrother, he's like six months older than my, than my brother. And then, you know, they're, so they're both around the year age, actually. Okay. So I can definitely relate to that, you know, it's, it's crazy. And, but it's kind of a weird age difference, right? Because yeah, you, you got to look out like, for them, but yeah. they also don't want you to overstep. Yeah, and then we used to fight like cats and dogs and off the chain, just yep. <laughs> craziness. Yep. Coming off the rails, taking them out. I get it. <laughs> <laughs> so you're growing up now. You're growing up with dad being in the cigar business. Yeah. Um, what was the first time you snuck a cigar out of the humidor? So actually, the truth is I never did. Really? Yeah. So what happened with my dad was he basically said, Hey, I'm in the tobacco business. I think it's a bad look if you smoke cigars before you turn 18 and not just that, but this question is going to come up and I don't want you to ever have to lie. So like, like you just asked me, when was your, well, when was your first cigar? And I don't have to lie, which is great. So my first cigar was on my 18th birthday. I had a max nano and I mean, I didn't, I wouldn't say I fell in love with cigars in my first cigar, but within that first like month of smoking cigars, I Max was a, fell in love a with short it. cigar for them. Yeah. yeah. It's one of my favorite cigars. Thank you. I appreciate that. I think over time it's actually just gotten better because I, or maybe my palate has just changed, but I think it's fantastic. So aside from your own cigars and your dad's line of cigars from Alec Bradley, like what kind of cigars do you like to smoke while you're just like relaxing and, you know, it, it could be brands or, you know, or just the type of, you know, leaf that you like to smoke. So uh, what kind of cigars um, do you like to Bradley smoke? and I, because, and even, even our dad, we're, we love this business and we're cigar nerds. So we literally smoke everything. We try everything. And Bradley's the one that really leads that up. He's he knows every release that's coming out. He freaking buys a box of everything so we can all try it. Um, I definitely have a profile that I enjoy. I like I smoke a lot of Viajes. I make I smoke a lot of Tatuajes. Um, some of Dion stuff. Uh, La Florida Minicana. Uh, some you know some stuff that AJ makes. Just the list the list goes on. But I try everything, and I have I'm. I'm definitely a little bit pickier when it comes to what I like. And Bradley has like a broader range of things that he enjoys in terms of profiles, but we both smoke and try everything just because we're cigar nerds. So nice. So what's your, what's your wildest, uh, you know, cigar industry story? Like it could happen at a trade show. There's so many of them. You're at the factory or just bullshitting with, uh, you know, with people, you know, just try to think of the wildest, craziest, there's so many. <laughs> There's so many. I'll just how about a funny one? I'll tell you a really good. Yeah, really good. that's basically what I was going for. Yeah. So we were down at, in Central America. I think we were in Nicaragua with Nestor Andres Placencia, and we were blending our first cigars. I think like rolling and blending our first cigars for the first time. And so we get in the van because we're gonna go to lunch. And Nestor says, Nestor Andres says. Let me try your cigar. So I hand it to him and he goes, not bad for your first time. Not great. Like I, I wouldn't recommend that you produce it, but not bad for your first time. And then he goes to Bradley, let me try your cigar. And Bradley hands it to him and he goes, Oh my God, this is, this is incredible. Like you just blended this and Brad lets him go on for like three or four minutes. And he goes, no, honestly, my, my first cigar was crap. Um, you're smoking a black market. I couldn't smoke my cigar anymore. And I lit up a black market and that's what you're smoking. And he was like, Oh my God, you little fucker. I thought you actually blended this cigar. <laughs> and everyone was just dying for like days after that. Cause he thought that Bradley blended a cigar that good on his first try. So when, so the, um, you've gone through getting your first blend out there cutting your teeth on that mm. saying here yeah, this is our thing blind faith then we go into the gatekeeper and now you you and bradley are 
uh, creating your third line. Um, yes. Talk, let's talk about that. Cool. Yeah. So the third line is going to be called Kintsugi. And I can already see everyone butchering the name. No problem. Happens with a, you know, happens with a lot of cigars. Well, I didn't ask you the name. <laughs> yeah. Kintsu, it's called Kintsugi. So what Kintsugi is, is this old Japanese art form where they would take broken um, ceramics like bowls or plates or vase, vases and they piece them back together with gold lacquer. And the story is really about the beauty and the imperfection. And with everything going on in our industry with against the FDA and everyone kind of taking different sides, our thought behind the, uh, you know, behind the project was let's create a cigar that is, it, the story behind it kind of is about trying to bring this industry back together a little bit and get everyone, getting everyone back on the same side. And hopefully at the end of this, everyone kind of comes back together stronger and better than we were before it all started, right? And the weird thing is what you've been noticing after coronavirus is coronavirus has really brought this industry back together in a lot of ways, which is horrible. Like I'm, I'm not thanking coronavirus for doing that. It just was a byproduct of it. And you see, you know, everyone doing these virtual interviews now and these round tables with different manufacturers and everyone kind of just getting together to help pave forward the industry in this very difficult time. And it just is the weirdest thing that we were creating this cigar based off of the fracturing within the industry. And then something happened that uh, something unfortunate happened that kind of brought it back together. Now, what is the blend on the Kintsugi? So the blend on Kintsugi is Honduran wrapper, I believe Honduran Indonesian binder and Honduran Nicaraguan filler. So it's a Honduran Puro. No, it has uh, Indonesian binder and Nicaraguan filler in oh. it as well, but it is being made in Honduras. And we are using some new Honduran tobacco that we recently, um, has recently gone through the fermentation process and is just excellent, excellent. And this is a little bit different. This, this, um, this is a little bit different for us because uh, Blind Faith was our, I would say, on the fuller side, medium to full, but on the fuller side, Gatekeeper ended up coming out medium plus. And then I would put this uh, Kintsugi, I wouldn't say from mild to medium, but just I would say medium or just below, which is not generally what Bradley and I smoke, but we wanted to show what our abilities were on this cigar. And so this is, I would say, either medium or just below medium. And I think that people are going to really enjoy it, or I hope so at least. How many different Vitolas are you making that in? We're talk we already have four for sure. We're talking about a fifth. Okay. Yeah. They've been delayed, right, coming to market because of this crisis? I, w I wish I could only blame it on the crisis. It's also because Bradley is – taking a second look at the artwork because of the crisis and now wants to make changes to the artwork. So that's also been delaying us a bit. Um, the cigars are going back into, are going into production tomorrow and we should hopefully be going to print within the next two to three weeks on the artwork. There's no rush for a PCA because we're not having one. No rush. So yeah, no rush, but time and, I was hoping this this um, this project was going to launch at the beginning of April. Mm -hmm. That was my goal, and then we ended up saying if we launch mid May, that would be great. Uh, mid May is here, and production hasn't started, so you'll you'll see it in a couple months. Mike, get any questions from the audience? That's what I'm looking at now. Uh, I've been kind of keeping my eye on it. I don't quite see any. But there was one from uh, they, uh, Lady my, uh, Wolves Softball. Uh, Lady Wolves Softball asks, I smoke a lot of Alec Bradley. Will Alec and Bradley be doing a full-body cigar? I think the Blind Faith is pretty full-bodied. So I yeah, would say that they... It is. I'm smoking it now, and it's, it's really good. <laughs> Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Yeah, that Blind Faith... Um, we start. We slowly started being able to open it up to more accounts, so it's more than just 150 accounts at this point. But yeah, it, they should be able to find it. 
Uh, your dad says, uh, nice job throwing your your brother under the bus. <laughs> my job. I'm his older brother. I always throw my younger brother under the bus. Actually, I had a question I was kind of formulating while you were talking. So, you know, our generation, you know, the millennials, how do you think that we're going to help the cigar industry in the future? You know, I know, you know, there's, you know, the more old school style, but, you know, mostly, you know, our generation is kind of bringing in like a newer approach. Do you think that it's going to change the cigar industry like in a good way in the future? Because um, obviously the legends, you know, are, are not going to be here forever. And neither are, you know, but as the years go on, how do you think that's going to look, um, you know, just as more younger people, you know, are jumping into the industry and stuff like that? So there's a, there's, I mean, I don't think this is exactly how you're asking, like asking the question, but the answer I'm going to, I've already thought about this a little bit. And one thing that I've noticed is the millennials are, they want an experience, right? Um, and you've seen this, this turn, you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, whatever it was, a lot of people, a lot of people were purchasing online. And what I think that millennials bring to the party is that since they want an experience that you're going to see a lot more people buying their cigars in the cigar store because they want the, the full experience of smoking in, in the cigar store. So I think that millennials potentially will bring, um, will bring more to the cigar shop environment because they want to be there, they want the full experience, and I think that you'll see cigar shops having this, even, even with this you know, weird time going on, this weird resurgence, and you'll see a lot more cigar shops opening up over the next 10, 15 years. Uh, to the point where potentially there's, I mean, I know in some states or cities they're everywhere, but you know, I, I don't want to say on every block, but you'll see a, a lot more cigar shops opening up. Because we're just experience nice. driven. Everything we want an experience. We, yeah. um, I mean, and it's great to be able to buy online. I think it's very, it's very convenient. And during this whole crisis, a lot of people have been doing it. But I do think that you're going to start seeing a lot of people. Um, starting to head more into back into cigar shops again. But then in terms of the industry, I think that no matter how you look at it, because it, it, you were more talking about like on the manufacturing side, right? Yeah, no, yeah, basically. The manufacturing side, I think that, about this as, as well recently, I because Boston Jimmy, you mentioned that you know, there's, you know, there's been these lineages of, of um, kids coming into their, you know, parents cigar company, like, like I've done. And there's always been that younger group that comes in that is now, they're now the older group, right? Yeah. So I think that whatever changes that you've already seen, like from them potentially, is kind of the same kind of thing that you're going to see as the millennials get into the cigar industry. I think packaging may change. I think change. I think that things will be a little less traditional like they already are yeah. and I just think that we're gonna you know pave the way forward though I think that I mean you could look at you know Carlito Fuente he was the young buck coming in at one point and now you're considering him potentially the older generation that's that's in this or whoever it may be that was just one example but there's, there's so many like a Hanky uh, Kelton was in and then Pedro. yeah George Padron like there's all these people that came in and they were the young, that young group. And I think that the millennials will just kind of do the same thing. You see, you know, Tony Gomez, there's so many, there's so many kids, or I don't want to say that we're kids, but you know, younger adults, my age get, getting into the industry with, you know, with their family. And I think we're just going to kind of do the same thing that as, but a little bit different than the previous generation that was the younger generation coming in. Okay. We actually have a few more viewer questions here, so uh, like about three of them. So uh, I'll just jump right in real quick. So yeah. Adam Machado, he says, not sure if this was covered, but why Alec and Bradley versus something else? So I think what he means by that is why are you going to name it after yourself versus name, you know, coming up with like a, another name? So we, there were a couple, there were a couple of reasons why we chose Alec and Bradley. Bradley obviously wanted to be Bradley and Alec because my name has always been first, but we explored coming up with different names. We talked about stuff like Ruben brothers or just all these different names. But when you look at your business plan essentially, and you have to think what's going to give you the best chance of success. And if we came in with this completely different name that nobody knew, 
there was not a customer base already able to attach to what we were doing as like at least as easily and coming and coming up with the name Alec Bradley even though it's so close to Alec Bradley it kind of had a built-in customer base which was yeah. just you know smart business essentially for us and because our father had always said you can either be Alan Rubin's sons or Alec and Bradley we were like it kind of just makes sense to, to go with Alec and Bradley it was yeah. It was just kind of funny off of what he always said to us. And we chose like, hey, that, that would be a cool name moving forward. Okay. And then also Steve from Frontline Cigars, he says, Alec, I'm a big fan of the coil. What is your favorite Alec Bradley cigar? If, we're, if I'm not going to talk about the Alec and Bradley and just go Alec Bradley, right now I would say the coil also. I smoke it in the Petit Lancero. I think... When, when this whole coronavirus started, I came home with two boxes because I didn't know how long this was going to be, obviously. I came home with two boxes. I brought home a box of Coyote Petit Lanceros and Gatekeeper Coronas. And so for like three or four weeks, that was all I was smoking. Mm. So I think right now, I, would, I mean, I just love that Coyote Petit Lancero. Nice. And then uh, Kevin uh, Schweitzer from Rockefeller Cigars, he wants you to talk about the tobacco used in the cigar called Honor of My Father. The I'm not sure what that one, is. the one that they oh have. the fine and rare yeah. <clears throat> right okay. so Kevin if you expect me to remember all ten different types of tobacco in that cigar <laughs> that that is not happening we have so I mean he understands it we have so many blends and so many cigars in the marketplace for me to remember every single blend that we have is is very tough but what's cool about that cigar and what it what has always been behind it is it's us kind of showing what we can do within our factory. So, you know, most cigars, you know, have between four to seven types of tobacco potentially. And we wanted to do something a little bit different. So we blended a cigar that had 10 different types of tobacco. I mean, it has a lot of Honduran, a lot of Nicaraguan in it, as you would expect. But um, yeah, that was us kind of just showing off a little bit of what we could really do in our factory and showing what their capabilities are. And there's a number. So for, the, for those that aren't familiar with that line from Alec Bradley Cigars, that's not a single blend. That there is, um, you've done those for a number of years, celebrating. Yeah, this will be our 10th year. And you celebrate um, the greats in the industry. You pay mm -hmm. homage to, to people. Yeah, so this year, um, the HOF stands for Honoring Our Father, and that's because my grandfather passed away not too long ago. And that was a release in honor of, of my grandfather, who I got to work with every day for over six years. My father worked with him every day for over 30 years. In the nuts and bolts business. They started the nuts and bolts. And then when my father started the cigar company, he came and worked for my father. Oh, what, what did grandpa do? Whatever needed to be done. Oh. Didn't matter. He was there every single day. He, so we didn't, op we don't open our doors till nine 30 and he got there, I believe at seven o'clock every morning. Okay. So open the doors, make sure everything was good. Got his coffee going. He was there every single day, seven o'clock. Um, I met your, I, I met your dad numerous times, but last year's PCA was special because they had an Alan Bradley event. And it allowed us to uh, really engage um, directly with your father. <clears throat> and also something special, he forged this relationship. He's got this thing going on with um, Lars Tetons. Yes. Are you looking at doing anything align along that line with Lars? Uh, on the Alec and Bradley side, no. Uh, and it's not because we wouldn't necessarily. It's just because we just started out and we are hyper focused on exactly what it is we're doing right now. And until we get to a certain point, we're just super focused on the release we're doing, trying to make our name for ourselves within this industry. Um, because it's not easy to gain respect within this industry. I mean, you definitely have to pay your dues. So it's not that, that, me and Bradley wouldn't do something necessarily with, with, with Lars. It's just that not right now. And I know you have some typical hobbies like golfing and such, mm -hmm. but I've 
studying a little bit about you, do you enjoy collecting vinyl? Yes. And yeah, um, I collect vinyl. It's been a little while since I've been able to get to a record store, unfortunately. But I think my collection is somewhere over 300 records at this point. And it's just because it's kind of like cigars in a way. You have to really take the time, select out which record you want to listen to. It, you're not going anywhere fast. It's the whole process of you know having to put the record on, move the needle, flip the record. Um, it just, there's something like, like with cigars, when you light up a cigar, you're not supposed to be going anywhere fast. Right. Um, you want to sit down, enjoy it, take your, you know, 30 minutes to your three hours, whatever it may be just to sit there and enjoy your, and I find with records, I get that same kind of feeling. So, yeah. I'm yeah. on the same page. I've been collecting records for a, a, a long time. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm, I'm from the vinyl era. Um, matter of fact, I was just going through my collection today and I just happened to br pick out. So this is the original 1969 pressing of Creedence Clearwater Revival, Willie and the Poor Boys. That's amazing. Okay. And of course, the best thing about these where there's always this really cool artwork on the yep. inside sleeve, mm -hmm. right? Absolutely. And this is, this is amazing because it's, a pressing from a company called Fantasy Records, right? I know nothing about it, yeah. I know nothing much about it anymore. But if you if you look at it, it actually says full radial stereo. That's that's hilarious. Okay, because back in the day, you know, before the six in the sixties, they had mm -hmm. it was mono. It wasn't yeah. stereo. Mm -hmm. So the sixties started bringing out stereo. And this one here is the, one of the original pressings um, in full radial stereo. And I, and I do keep great. a pound My of record player is actually was made in the 80s. And Mine I, too. Yeah. I finally um, went and just picked it up from my parents' house because I was in the process of moving and everything. And they were like, hey, you still, you still have stuff at our house from over you know four or five years ago, the last time that you lived here time to come get it <laughs> so <laughs> i already i have a couple record players um but that was like my main one my favorite one from the 80s and like i have another one here but it's it's not as as nice in my opinion or whatever it is it doesn't produce as good as good of a sound so i finally went and got that and i can't wait to set it up the hardest part i found i have an akai turntable mm -hmm. back in 19 actually 1979 i think i bought it and i've had it ever since and the hardest thing to get for that was, well, you can't get the needle. The needle, forget it. Try to yeah, buy yeah, a needle. No way. You used to be able to go to a record store and buy a needle. You get the, there's no such thing as a record store, and buying needles are very difficult to do. So you had to buy the whole cartridge that comes with yeah. the needle. So I had to find some place online to get the right one for that particular turntable. Luckily, the record store I go to still sells the cartridges. So I can get them there sometimes, but most it's just so much easier to, to order them online at this point. Yeah, so much easier. That was a good now, question. Now, uh, like Alec, are you into hip hop as well, or do you do you collect records from like all genres? Or oh yeah, I mean I have Tupac records. I have I've got a decent. I just picked up a Mac Miller record recently. I, nice. I collect from. I'm all over the board. Yeah. Yeah, because you're down south. There's a DJ that I know. Uh, his name is Raylo, and I don't know if you ever heard of them damn dogs. But no, been, I have they, not. But they, they've been, you know, known down south for like a long time. And Raylo, he can't, you know, he's, I don't know how old he is. He's definitely, you know, older. You know, he's been DJing for like over 30 years or something. Mm -hmm. like that. And, uh, you know, he's got a huge collection of records. So he's actually a cool guy out. You know, you can go on my page and like look them up and tell them I said to you, you might have some stuff that you might be interested in the future or whatever. Because he's got yeah, absolutely. If you could send me a message after this, just so I have I have all the info, like I would I would love that. It's been a little bit since I've gotten to go to the record store, but it's yeah. just it's such a great experience getting to go in there and shuffle through everything they have, kind of just pick out a gem sometimes, and yeah. it just it slows you down a little bit, which yeah, I like. definitely yeah. But yeah, definitely send me that info. For sure. Well, I'm going to go over some of the news of Stogie Press. 
Let's do uh, it. From this week, because that's for the next segment of the show. Right, so the first bit of news here uh, was from Island Lifestyle Import- Importers Creates ADAP program. Uh, so it's a bit of news that Boston Jimmy, Jimmy, so basically, uh, I didn't even read this, so it's kind of awkward, but uh, so the, the PCA convention has unfortunately but necessarily been canceled for 2020. Island Lifestyle Cigars and Tommy Bahama Luxury Cigar Accessories have established the additional dealer assistance program for retailers. Uh, it says we will miss seeing our old friends and making new ones. We enjoy spending that time getting to know and learn more about their business that provides a valuable feedback as we grow and develop new products. Uh, so it looks like it's, um, you know, it's a way to, to get, uh, you know, to, for addition, you know, additional deals or something like that. That's cool. So, I mean, I think that's a great yeah, idea because they're still, that, they're still trying to figure out how to connect with their retailers and consumers which is fantastic. I mean, you have, we're in a very weird time right now and to be innovative is extremely smart. And I think it's, this whole thing is going to force everyone to be a little bit more innovative. Yep. And And I mean, what were we saying? Go ahead. Go go ahead. I was just saying, if you look what's happened the last two months and a little bit longer, how many, how many more, you know, zoom video, zoom meetings or zoom uh, interviews or round tables have gone on everyone's kind of adopted this thing and it was forced because of coronavirus, unfortunately, but I think it's going to create this. Uh, I don't think this is going to go away. And so for yeah. them to be innovative right now, I, just, I think it's just super smart. Yeah. And then of course, you know, the news that every media, you know, all cigar media covered this week that the 2020 PCA, yep. you know, it canceled the trade show. Um, mm-hmm. Actually, uh, Barry Bones Argento, who's a friend of mine, he said the PCA has canceled. What are your thoughts? So if you could give us a quick rundown of what are your thoughts on that? Um, my thoughts are it being canceled was the right move for the industry. Uh, my father said it the other day, and I, I really agree with his take on it. The PCA is the PCA. Basically, the manufacturers go to the PCA because that's where the retailers are going to be. And the retailers mm-hmm. go to PCA because that's where the manufacturers are going to be. And with yeah all this stuff just up in the air right now and no one knowing what's going on, it doesn't create, uh, what's, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, confidence on potentially either, either the manufacturer side or the retailer side to know that the companies that the retailers were going to want to see are going to be there or the retailers that the manufacturers want to see are going to be there. So for it to just, to, for it to be canceled or postponed potentially for now, I think is just the right, the right move. Yeah, and Boston Jimmy is back. Uh, so I'll just go over the. I'll continue. I'll continue real quick, and Boston Jimmy can give his thoughts. And of course, oh, real quick, uh, what are you seeing on the on your screen? Because something glitched here. I I I I'm sharing the screen, and I'm going over the news since you dropped oh, okay. out. Okay. Yeah, and then so I, I talked about the first couple things, and then now I'm talking about uh, that Cajun Cigar Czar opening innovative distribution channels. Uh, what are your thoughts on that, Jimmy, since you're back and all that? And well, I think the this whole concept that we have now with uh, the brands um, helping to open up, sh- you know, help shops out, um, having these special programs are are excellent in, in keeping the lights on with these Absolutely. shops. So um, I guess the question would be is, uh, is Alec and Bradley and Alec Bradley looking to do similar things? Can you explain what it is a little bit, just so so that I'm I'm aware what they're doing? Yeah, they uh from I read up on this because I was always wondering, but they basically they they have these like humidors that are put in areas where there's not a lot of you know cigar shops or whatever, and it's Got like it. and it's made with technology, so you know brands can put their cigars on the humidor, and then the the technology in it you know will let you know, the people running those human doors, like when they need to come restock and stuff like that. And so it gets people's brands into the, into the, uh, the hands of people that don't have, you know, a lot of access, you know, they can mm-hmm. put the human doors in places like gas stations or golf courses. So like a vending machine for cigars. Yeah. But it's in lamest you know, terms. Yeah. Yes. Pretty much. Uh, yeah. That's from what, what I understand. I've, 
you know, I, I looked at, you know, more information about that earlier. Well, that's, that's very cool. And we're honestly not doing anything like that ourselves at the moment, just because, it, you know, probably a lot of money to invest to figure out how to make that happen. But we are doing different things now. Um, we're reaching out to our retailers constantly, setting up Zoom meetings with them to figure out what we can do to be, you know, a better partner to them. And we're pretty much open to any and all ideas right now. We're doing virtual events. We're doing all this different stuff. Um, our outreach to our retailers and consumers has been giant just because we want to make sure if anyone needs assistance, we're there. And if, even if it's something they didn't think of, we try to help figure out ways to help make them more, our retailers more successful. So we're completely open to any and all ideas at the moment. And we're, we're pushing forward, you know, and you have to be innovative, innovative in a time like this to, you know, survive and thrive. So the question I had earlier was, um, in, in addition to that, there are companies that are doing things like um, the Bold Project and um, some of the, some of these uh, companies that are working with um, shops to, uh, you could order directly from the manufacturer. The, you order from the, from the shop, but the manufacturer drop ships it to your house. Yeah, so we had talked about that because we had seen that other companies were doing it. I, I don't know if I know, I know for a fact we haven't done it yet, but I don't know if we will potentially be moving forward with that. Um, but I think it's it's a great idea, and if it works for a shop and we can help them out with some sales, I mean, I think it, I think it, you know, we'll, we won't hesitate to do it. Awesome. And the the bad the last piece of cigar news that dropped this week was. Uh, Crux Cigars start shipping Limitada 2020. And uh, if you want to talk about that a little, Boston Jimmy, I know I had to kind of carry the show to keep it going. For yeah, the, the Limitada segment. <laughs> the Limitada uh, is a yearly release that they do. Mm -hmm. um, what Crux did when they started the company, they actually purchased a bunch of special leaf. And they, they dig into that leaf year after year to create what they call their Limitada series. It's a limited production um, and they, every year they come out with it. So this is the, the latest one, the 2020. It uses very similar tobaccos, um, mm -hmm. much of the same you've seen in the others, but it's just aged a year longer, a year longer and a year longer. Interesting. So it's very- I've not had that, I'd like to try it. Yeah, I, I've enjoyed their, their Limitada selections. What are you pairing? What do you like to pair with your cigars? Oh, do you have like another three hours to stay on this? Because uh, I you whiskey about that guy? For, I'm a giant whiskey guy. Um, most pairings that I do are with whiskey. I also pair with coffee. Um, I'm, I get nerdy about stuff, just like I get nerdy with cigars. Uh, I'll pick a topic and just learn everything about it, get completely just like into it in every aspect. And whiskey is a venture that I've been on for the last year and a half to two years. I want to try everything from every country that produces whiskey. I, um, I buy way too much of it and just so I can try everything. And lately I've been doing a lot of the pairings for Alec Bradley since our partners are William Grant and Sons who own Glenfiddich, Balvenie, uh, Hudson Bourbon, so on and so forth. And I, actually it's not just me that does it, it's me and my father and Bradley, but I've been getting more and more into it on my own. So I love pairing cigars and whiskey, love it. And right now, like with this, uh, with this gatekeeper Corona, I wanted the gatekeeper to shine a little bit more. So I picked, I picked up a, a weeded Woodford that was going to be a little bit on the lighter side. I also haven't eaten in a while, so I didn't want anything that was going to, you know, give me, that was going to be too high of a proof. That was going to give me like too much of a buzz on this or anything. So I went with a, a little bit lighter whiskey. Uh, it was Weedford, the Woodford weeded. And with this, I mean, it just lets the lets the gatekeeper shine. Nice, nice. Yeah, I was um, over in vacation in Ireland mm -hmm. <clears throat> about three years ago, and I got hooked on craft Irish whiskeys. And I was a big single malt guy. I mm -hmm. love my various single malts, but I was over there and I found some really interesting whiskeys that some are in the states and some aren't yet. There's 19 new distilleries opening up in Ireland 
craft. Yeah, I mean, I, I know in Ireland, um, there's a few giant distilleries that own most of the brands, but I do know that, you know, a lot of smaller distilleries have been opening up. What have you had? Uh, that's that, what, what would you consider craft within the um, Irish whiskey world? Maybe. I've so you're looking at things like Red Breast. I got a bottle right next to me. That, Red, that is amazing whiskey with a cigar. I have a, the one next to me that I have right now is a Red Breast 12 uh, barrel proof. Yep. Yep. That cinnamon and honey note to it, like a peppery honey note to it. Yeah. yeah oh, yeah. That is that right there. good. That's great pairing for a cigar. I agree, but you need a cigar that's going to hold up to this because, it, you know, it is, what is it? It's uh, 100 in, 110 proof, something like that, 100, 112 proof, that's maybe. That's a barrel. Yeah, that's a barrel. Yeah. One. yeah. It's kind of young. A little bit, but it's got some it's got some power to it. So, I mean, it's pretty heavy. So you you really want the right cigar to go with that. I would say Blind Faith would probably go with that pretty well, actually. Probably, it yeah. can hold up to that for sure. Yeah, and I would definitely. also be into like a uh, like a lot of Woolen. <laughs> I'm a big PD guy. I am not yet, unfortunately. Uh, it just my palate is not has not I've not shifted toward that point of peated. Um, I thought. Because I was as I was getting into whiskey, I thought I have two directions that I can go. I can either go down the barrel proof um, bourbons, or I can start exploring uh, the pita stuff a little bit. And so I kind of went down the the road of the high proof bourbons. There you go. Yeah, very good. Both are challenging on the palate. It's just in different ways. That's for sure. And you know, I, I can also get into drinking a good. Know, fine gin martini, dry martini with a cigar. Yeah, classic. Absolutely. Right? Um, yeah, there's different drinks for different occasions, just like there's different cigars for different occasions. And red wine. Old that day. is something I want to get further down that rabbit hole, but I've just been on this whiskey train for a while. I think my next thing will be coffee. I'll start exploring coffee, learning a little bit more about coffee, and then potentially red wine after that. There's a lot of brands out there that are now going into the coffee business on top of their cigars. Absolutely. There's a ton. You guys but, considering that? Oh uh, yeah. We've talked about it and we have friends that are in the coffee business. And actually last time I was in Honduras, was this last time? Maybe the time before I met a guy that used to work for eCafe, which is one of the largest coffee companies in Central America. And he had branched out on his own and started becoming, he became a coffee broker and he'd been in, the coffee business down in Honduras for 20 plus years. And we just happened to be sitting at the hotel, smoking cigars, drinking whiskey. He lit up a cigar and, you know, we're, we're, you know what cigars do? They bring people together, right? Absolutely. So he came from, yeah, a, he was only sitting, you know, 30, 40 feet from us, whatever it was. Within 20 minutes, he was sitting down with us, having some whiskey. We were talking cigars, whiskey, coffee, and um, the next the next day when I got back to my hotel room, there were bags of coffee sitting in my hotel room that he asked the um, he asked the front desk to put in my hotel room. So I got to come home and try all this amazing coffee. And it really has bothered me ever since because I've never been able to find a coffee that was as, as good as the coffee that he left in my, in my hotel room. Or he had the front desk leave in my hotel room. So I've been on this constant search to find coffee that was as good as that coffee. I've even reached out to him. I gotta, I gotta, re I gotta contact him again and see how I can get some. So you like it black, or do you like it sweet? Black. That's yeah. the right way to drink it. I, when I grew up, I hated coffee. Mm -hmm. Couldn't stand it. All through college, I was drinking Coca Cola. And everybody else is drinking coffee. Mm -hmm. I go to work, my first job, I'm drinking Coca Cola in the morning, and my friend looks at me. He goes, "Don't you drink coffee?" And I said, "This stuff's disgusting." Right, because my mother always made it with the milk and the cream, mm -hmm. the sugar, and I was just like, it was horrible. It's like, it's just like I, I look at the the, the 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 milk curd as you pour it in. Right? Yeah, and that's just disgusting, right? And he says, "No, did you ever try black?" And I'm like, "Are you kidding me? I don't like coffee." He says, "Try it. Trust me." So I got a got a cup of coffee, black, and I was hooked on that moment. I was like, "Wow, this." Is it's just you don't pick up all the flavors when you add the you know the cream and the sugar. It's like, and I mean, I still do it, but it's like making a whiskey cocktail. You're just not going to get the flavors of what that whiskey was meant to be. 
it doesn't mean it's wrong. I mean, I still drink whiskey cocktails, but you're just not going to get the full effect. And same thing with coffee. See, I'm one of the people that likes cream and sugar in my coffee, but I don't overdo it so that, you know, I'm not. It's I not can like see you putting like 17 scoops of sugar in there. Come on. No, I'm just joking. No, but I, like, like I, I, I have overdone it in the past, but I don't mm. overdo it now. And you can still get, you know, the flavors, but it all together is just, I just like, enjoy it like that. And yeah, try no, drink, everything, you know, coffee, everything but, should be enjoyed the way that people like it. There's no yeah. right or wrong way to enjoy it. I definitely tried black coffee before and I, I gave it a, a solid, you know, fair chance several different times at different mm -hmm. times. And I got to have my cream and sugar, but, you know, just a little bit of that. And, and then, you know, it just makes it excellent for me, you know? Yeah, of course. Like I said, it, everything should be enjoyed the way that someone enjoys it. There's no right or wrong thing. Everyone has their own palate. Definitely. So your travels around Central America, you gravitate to Honduran coffee, Nicaraguan coffee. I've had great, I've had great coffee from from both countries. It's not that I gravitate toward one or the other. It just happened to be that uh, in that one instance, it happened to be Honduran coffee from the actual area that we were in in uh, Don Lee. But no, I mean I go, I go all over the board. I try from everywhere, and I just I haven't had the time to delve into coffee as much because I've been focused. I mean, I'm always focused on cigars, but I've been focusing on whiskey, but I'm sure I will make a transition and really get to learn everything I want to learn about coffee soon. Got a lot of time, you know, it takes, it takes yeah, one of these. Yeah, I got the time. Yeah. <laughs> it takes yeah. one of these it, to start. I just shaved, but I, I started. I do something. <laughs> it, takes, it takes time. Nothing, nothing is meant to be done quickly necessarily. I mean, if you really want to learn about something, you have to take the time to to study it and understand it. All right, so we've uh, come upon and beyond the hour. Um, Alec, it's been a pleasure uh, talking to you. Um, the audience is growing all the time, so thank you for joining the show. Uh, love to get your brother on uh, sometime soon, get his spin on the business. Well, guys, I mean, it's been an absolute pleasure uh, to be on the show. I had a great time, and I know my brother would definitely jump on. He would have no problem doing that. Now, does he so still have the you, porn stash? He does. He does have the porn stash. <laughs> yeah, I got to well, tell you, I got to tell you, more when Bradley and I are on these things together, we get there are more comments about the porn stash than about any cigar related questions at all. Like, yeah. I would say over 50% of the comments are always about the porn stash. I want to thank everybody. Uh, again, if you enjoy these shows, they're all post produced and put on the Stogie Press YouTube channel. And we'll have this one post-produced, and it'll also be uh, an article out on it real quick, and I'll point you to the YouTube um, in case you don't find the YouTube channel for whatever reason. And that's it, and we're good. That's it, baby. So Thank you, guys. Appreciate... I really appreciate you. No, appreciate you having me on. It was a great time. It was awesome. Tell your dad I said hi. I think he's watching right now. So Yeah, I'm sure he is. <laughs> he's going to let you know everything that you did right or wrong, right? <laughs> yeah, or everything I did wrong properly. <laughs> so this is awesome. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining.